Hello, thank you all for joining us today for the Perinatal District for North Carolina Health Innovations Office Hours. Um, with me today, my name is Kate Menard. I'm a maternal fetal medicine specialist at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill and uh, the obstetric champion for our perinatal district in maternal health innovations. With me today um, is Kimberly Harper and Kristen Resnick, who are two um, perinatal nurse outreach coordinators for the district and will be with us today as we and, and help uh, facilitate and answer your questions after our uh, presentation. Today's topic is on severe hypertension during pregnancy and postpartum, an overview of the new standards of the joint, new Joint Commission standards and the, and the AIM bundle. We're gonna start today by kind of centering, centering ourselves a bit in why we do what we do. I hope you never have to read this letter. I cannot imagine you having to go through this yet again. And if you are, I am so truly sorry, Mommy. I hope you know how much I love you and how much you mean to me. I am sorry that I have left you. On the particular day that I am writing this, I have no idea how that may have occurred, but know that I would never choose to leave you. You will forever be my Mommy and I your baby girl. Shalon was my only daughter. She was loving. She was kind. She was generous. She was just always a curious child and loved to learn. She graduated from high school after skipping two grades. She went on to get her bachelor's at Hampton University. From there, she got a master's of science and then was accepted into a PhD program at Purdue University. She graduated with a dual PhD in both sociology and in gerontology. And she was the first student to do that at Purdue University. Both degrees were summa cum laude and all by the age of 25. She went on to public health because she had watched her brother who was battling MS. So she decided she'd go and get a master's of public health from Johns Hopkins and then went on to become a well-respected epidemiologist at the Center for Disease Control. Unfortunately, her brother passed away, but she still devoted the work that she did at the CDC to her brother. Siobhan was a very adventurous spirit and we had traveled to over 20 countries in the last five years. She just loved life. When Shalon found out that she was pregnant, she was just overjoyed. She had wanted to be a mother for so long. She went to every single OB appointment. She did everything her obstetrician required of her. She had had um, fibroids removed probably a year before the pregnancy. And then she found out at the time that she had factor V Leiden. So she also had to take two painful shots every day to keep from clotting while she was carrying her baby. Well, based on her history, her medical team thought it was best that she have a planned C-section. She was prepared, she was ready, and she couldn't wait to meet the tiny human that she'd been sharing space with for 37 weeks. Shalon had tears in her eyes. She was so, so excited to see her daughter, and Shalon just held her. Within four or five days after getting home, she developed a lump on her side. She started having other symptoms as well, headaches, she wasn't voiding as she should have been. Her legs started to swell. She started to gain weight. She had headaches. And every time we'd go in to see a doctor, she was just dismissed with, you just had a baby, give it time. It'll get better. And she says, mom, I, I don't feel right. There's something wrong. And I was just so concerned, but I, I didn't know what to do. During the last week of her life, Shalon went to the doctor three times for the same symptoms. On that last visit, she presented with blood pressure of 174 over 120. Well, let me give you some blood pressure medicine and you go home and come back in a couple of days if it hasn't gotten better. But don't worry, it should be fine. Just give it a little more time. Well, after we left the doctor's office, we went um, and picked up her prescription and we came home. 
And so we were sitting there um, talking a little bit more and all of a sudden um, she started to have this gargled sound that came out of her mouth and her, her arm shot up and she passed out. And I called 911, probably five or six minutes later, the ambulance was there. When I got to the hospital, um, the emergency doctor told me that she was in pretty bad shape. I found out a couple of days later that she was brain dead because of the lack of oxygen. My cousin brought in a medical directive that I didn't even know Shalon had. And it said, mommy, I will fight hard, but if there is no hope, please let me go. And the next night, I happened to notice just one tear. It seemed like that came out of one eye. And I knew then what I had to do. We had her taken off life support at 914. She was gone. I lost my vibrant, beautiful, intelligent, best friend and daughter because she wasn't heard. I knew Shalon was a high-risk pregnancy because of her age, but I never for a moment thought that she was at risk of dying because she was a Black woman. Like Siobhan Irving, approximately 700 women die in the U.S. each year, with 60% of those thought to be preventable. I've watched this video many times and have been on the podium with Siobhan Irving's mother and her daughter as they bravely and eloquently share their story every time. And now today I feel a heaviness in my heart and chest and my eyes are wet as I relate to the pain and the suffering of mother and daughter due to a potentially preventable death. I'm inspired to keep working in this space of improving care for mothers and helping to expand the dimensions through which we can accomplish these goals. And I'm so grateful for the ranks of providers, nurses, public health professionals, advocacy groups, and all of those on the webinar today or who will watch it later um, for supporting this cause. Our focus today is on treatment of hypertension because of its position among the highest contributors to preventable maternal morbidity and mortality. It was in 2012 that leaders in public health, ACOG, SMFM, A1, uh, payers, health regulators, including the Joint Commission, convened to come to consensus on how to best address improvement in maternal morbidity and mortality. From that convening emerged the what was called the Partnership for Maternal Safety. It found its home at the Council on Patient Safety and Women's Health Care, which is based at ACOG, but is a group of um, a, a vast um, multidisciplinary um, or, uh, organizations. This was a shared commitment to the development and implementation of safety bundles on hemorrhage, hypertension, and thromboembolism prevention. Soon thereafter, HRSA funded this work um, as the Alliance for Innovation and Internal Health, now called AIM, with the eventual goal of engaging every state and maternity hospital in this work. Those of you that have been engaged with the uh, Picnic Quality Collaborative in North Carolina know that um, North Carolina worked on a, 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 a project they called CMOP, which was conservative management of preeclampsia, but it really had a big component now uh, in it of the uh, importance of timely treatment of maternal hypertension. A wise individual at that meeting stated that there were two things that can reliably drive change in healthcare. One is payment policies and another is regulation. While some of us have an aversion, a deep aversion in our guts to regulation and joint commission surveys, in this instance, I believe it's driving investment uh, by hospital administrators in maternal quality and is driving meaningful change. Indeed, most of what, uh, of, of what a joint commission selects to do drives meaningful change. 
In response to unacceptably high maternal mortality rates in the US after reviewing expert literature, the Joint Commission determined that the highest impact actions to decrease maternal complications, particularly hemorrhage and severe hypertension preeclampsia, um, it includes prevention, recognition, and timely treatment. Gosh, that sounds a lot like AIM. As a result, with the support of, tech, of the Technical Advisory Panel, the Joint Commission developed the two new standards for hospitals with requirements that focus on uh, these complications. This R3 report was published in August of 2019 and describes in, in detail with references the rationale for each of the requirements. Provision of care, treatment, and service standards were initially selected to be effective in July of 2020, but um, in March of 2020, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the requirements were revised to be effective in uh, January of 21. So we're all in the midst of that right now. So the standard 0603 is to reduce the likelihood of harm related to maternal severe hypertension preeclampsia. I'm gonna just kind of walk you through how um, these six components um, that are described in the Joint Commission requirements um, are analogous and, and really closely parallel uh, the work that's been recommended through AIM and the, and the hypertension preeclampsia bundle. The first component is um, to develop written evidence-based um, procedures for measuring and remeasuring blood pressure. These procedures should include criteria that identify the patients that have severely um, elevated blood pressures. As you can see on the right side of the screen, these are basic components of recognition and prevention protocol for management, a protocol for measurement of, hyperten of, of hypertension and, and, and readiness. And that is diagnostic criteria and systems in place for effective um, monitoring and treatment. Procedures should address appropriate blood pressure measurement, including cuff size, proper patient positioning, and frequency of measurement. Too often, inaccurate measurement can lead to a mother not receiving proper treatment and being discharged with elevated blood pressures. Untreated hypertension can lead to morbidities or even death. Criteria for what constitutes severely elevated blood pressure should be established by the organization, utilizing current recommendations from national organizations. Implementation in our own institution um, included, and, and should in yours as well, a protocol for blood pressure man, me, measurement. We all learned, you know, in nursing school or in or in medical school, or um, the how to how to take a blood pressure. But do we do we ensure that it's consistently provided? A woman should should be at rest. The cuff size needs to be appropriate. She should be positioned properly. Um, her posture with back supported, feet supported no conversation during the blood pressure measurement and, and the frequency of measurement uh, of measures and kind. I will be the first to admit that I have observed many and I'll say formally in my, in my uh, uh, career and um, I, don't, I don't tolerate it today, but a, a preeclamptic woman in the hospital in bed, we would pad the sides because of, pre, of eclampsia pr pr protocols, she'd be at rest. Her blood pressure should be recumbent with on her side. Um, and that's gonna, but could potentially give you a falsely low blood pressure if the cuff isn't um, proper pos positioned properly. We want to be sitting up um, with uh, with proper posture, legs down, feet supported, um, so we can get consistent measurements. And those are the measurements on which we base um, the science of, of appropriate recommendations. Identifying the women at risk um, is is really important. It's it needs to be. Uh, uh, recognize that not all of these women that are going to need treatment are going to be on the labor delivery unit where our nurses and our providers are used to addressing this in a timely manner in a, uh, with regularity and know the thresholds with which with, um, that, that, that should be applied to the pregnant population, which can be quite different than um, the general population. So then in the emergency room or even in the ICU, knowing um, that a woman is, is pregnant or recently pregnant and, and taking that into account in terms of deciding who is at risk and who needs to be treated um, as, a, as an urgent um, action is very important. Our EPIC system at UNC um, has what we call hover to discover. 
So there's a little icon up, up in the corner that's a, that's a stork. And if you hover over that stork, up, up pops a, a message that says she's currently pregnant and her gestational age. If you hover over the baby carriage, um, what pops up is that the patient was recently pregnant and delivered um, and, and that she delivered two months ago, for example. So this is just one way of, of uh, ensuring that uh, providers throughout the hospital are able to tune into the special needs of our pregnant, pregnant or, or, or recently pregnant population. The other, the, the other, the second standard really that um, is, is described here that the Joint Commission puts forth, and that is to develop written evidence-based procedures for managing pregnant and postpartum patients with severe hypertension that includes this list of items. Medications need to be stocked and immediately available in the obstetric unit. This is something that for sure they'll check when they come around and is essential to um, uh, uh, having this done well. The use of seizure prophylaxis um, should be uh, documented, the, the procedures for that documented, the protocols for that well documented and implemented. Guidance on when to consult additional experts and consider transfer to a higher level of care. All of these things are within, are similar to what we've become uh, accustomed to doing in the context of the, of the AIM hypertension bundle. Um, what's different about the Joint Commission requirements and not particularly contained in the hypertension bundle and, um, is, is guidance on when to use continuous fetal monitoring. It's certainly important, but it wasn't included in the, in the initial, original hypertension bundle. And guidance on to when, when, to, when to consider um, emergency delivery. Finally, on this list is the criteria for when, when uh, uh, a team debrief is required. That, um, and importantly, the written procedure should be developed by a multidisciplinary team that includes representation from obstetrics, the emergency department, anesthesia, uh, nursing, laboratory. In our institution, the role of pharmacy in getting this work done was especially important. So again, just to use an example, the example of UNC, um, we, uh, it's easy, very easy to come up with an algorithm for, for treatment of hypertension for, in pregnancy and postpartum women. You can pull, take this one, pull it off the web. You know, there's, there's, ACOG has, has nice um, algorithms like that well laid, out, well, well laid out for us. What's much more difficult is, is the engagement of that multidisciplinary team that I described and, and, and then just making sure all of these meds are, are you know, approved by pharmacy, ready, readily available to our nurses to pull and um, you know, kind of in the hands of, of the nurses and the providers in a timely manner. The thresholds um, for the UNC algorithm are pretty standard. Um, a systolic blood pressure over 160 um, and a diastolic blood pressure over 110. Uh, repeat that blood pressure within 15 minutes alert alert the um, licensed practitioner and treat. You know, we want, we want to treat, you know, ideally we would treat within 30 minutes. Certainly you want to, want to treat, within an, or treat within an hour. And out here, down here are the options for treatment. Um, and then specifics about when to repeat um, and retreat. Um, who to engage, once again, um, the team. OB providers, anesthesia, administrative support from the L&D, but that's not enough. You need antepartum and postpartum teams, support service from pharmacy, the consulting teams, um, emergency department physicians, and your ICU team. If your ICU team is used to taking care of older men, you know, they've seen 160 over 110 a lot and aren't getting excited about that. But if it's a, if it's a young postpartum, recent, recently delivered postpartum woman, that's, that's an urgent, urgent uh, treatment scenario. And your informatics team and QI support can help with this um, a lot as well in terms of helping with, with uh, alerts and so on. Again, we're still on, we're still on the, on the um, uh, second criteria. I want to show you what just what, what we've put together on our uh, medication cart um, for hypertension for UNC. We've got the, the, the medications that we use regularly, including magnesium sulfate, but the antihypertensive medications that we use regularly, the doses are right there, how often they're repeated, what the maximum dose is in a, for, a, for over a 24 hour period and the appropriate monitoring. 
you know, even if you do this a lot, it's hard to keep all of these details in your head. Is it 20? Is it 40? How fast do I go up? Da, da, da. How often do I repeat? How often can I repeat? Each of these has a different little bit of a different nuance. Um, so having this, having this available in, a, in, a, in an urgent and stressful situation, it's really wonderful to be able to pull it out, you know, have a, have a, a team member read it out, confirm that we're doing it right, and, and move forward. And what about when the refractory to the, to the meds that we use routinely? This in our institution is escalated then to an intensive care unit um, situation if we're gonna use intravenous um, antihypertensive medications. But our ICU team is not, is not you know, doing ca caring for pregnant or postpartum women every day. Um, so having these um, protocols that are reviewed by the pharmacy and standardized, so um, across, across all of our pregnant and postpartum women that, that, that go off, off to another floor, is very helpful. Um, it doesn't, doesn't require anybody to go looking anything up. Um, these are protocols and order sets that, are, um, that were agreed upon by leadership from all of these units um, um, and then affirmed by by our, our pharmacy team and available in, in this way and, and order sets to go along with that makes it, um, you know, elevates the level of safety um, for all of this work. Again, moving through kind of, there's a lot packed into this, this second criteria, um, but um, let's not forget that, that um, you know, continuous fetal monitoring and, and when to deliver um, needs to be uh, included in your written protocols. The third element pertains to um, education, providing role-specific education uh, to all staff and providers who treat pregnant and postpartum patients with these evidence-based protocols. So we've, we've got an evidence-based protocol, we've got order sets, we've got that, that the pharmacy's approved. Um, we need to educate everybody so that they're used, right? At a minimum, joint commission's requiring that at a minimum, we have education at orientation. Um, and then whenever changes are made, of course, um, but then every, every, every two years. Where um, it's extra important to expand, again, outside of your labor and delivery unit, the emergency department is where patients often pre um, pre pre present with symptoms or signs of severe hypertension. Um, for, that, for that reason, the emergency room staff and providers need to have this, pro these protocols in place as well um, uh, with drills and post-drills debriefs. A tool that was developed by our implementation team at UNC is this, I think this is a lovely little infographic um, for hypertension. It, it, again, this little mouse um, is, is that what I taught, taught you all about already, which is the hover to discover. Um, you can, it, it, it reminds people that they can, this baby carriage and this stork helps to um, bring to their attention the fact that a woman was, is pregnant or um, was recently pregnant and bright and front center, big and red as can be, is the threshold um, that we define as severe hypertension that needs e immediate treatment, 160 over 110. Again, in the ICU, they, they might see that frequently and not respond to it in the same way, um, unless they're really in tune to the fact that she was pre is pregnant or recently pregnant. And if you know they don't have the, the algorithm for treatment front of mind, um, they can slide down here to the green area when, and, and click on the algorithm and up right there on the web comes, um, comes the algorithm and the table for treatment. So kind of closing that loop to make it all. So it's a good education tool, but it's also a good reminder because it's there and, and um, front of mind uh, in the units. The fourth component is uh, requirement is to conduct drills at least annually. Um, to determine system issues that might come up um, and, and, and areas for quality improvement. Again, this is a part of the readiness piece in the, in the um, AIM bundle um, and also includes uh, team, the, the, team, the team debrief component. Multidisciplinary drills give an organization the opportunity to practice skills and identify systems issues in a controlled environment. It's critical to have members from as many disciplines as possible available during these drills to truly be able to test each level of the emergency and identify areas for improvement. Organizations should assess their level of proficiency to determine the frequency drills should be performed and organizations that have reached a high level of mastery might do these drills less frequently. 
the emergency drills might include your rapid response. Somebody, you know, what is your rapid response setup? Someone from each team um, is, is needed in nursing, OB, anesthesia, maybe your surgical tech, and, and define the roles within that team. Um, and this builds, if you, if you rehearse, it builds a level of trust. It, it really, it really, you know, knows, uh, the team gets to know where to expect who to be at the right time. Um, not too different than the third baseman knowing that the, the second baseman is going to be there on the base, on the base when they get there. What, what provider group um, will lead the current care? This is rehearsed in, um, in, in, in drills. And then uh, when can care be moved over uh, to another provider? All of that um, kind of can become more seamless if we practice. The fifth element is reviewing severe hypertension preeclampsia cases that meet criteria by the hospital to evaluate the effectiveness of care, treatment, um, and services provided to the um, to the patient during the event. Similarly, reporting systems, it, it's in the AIM bundle to do multidisciplinary reviews. Continuous feedback loops are imperative for organizations to find errors and improve skills to ensure that patients are receiving the highest level of care. Root cause analyses, um, uh, apparent, you know, and similar skills to review the care with rigorous, and, and you know, it, th these can be, um, you know, in a safe environment, it's, it's, it's critical to identify successes and opportunities for improvement in a way that creates a culture of safety and empowers staff um, uh, to design safe and effective procedures and processes. The sixth element has to do with providing printed, printed education uh, for patients and really educating our patients in general. Maternal mortality reviews have shown that some patients with severe hypertension, preeclampsia, um, after discharge, they, they, they develop it after discharge because they're unaware of the symptoms to watch for and then to seek care urgently, this doesn't come to our attention. Women should understand their severe hypertension diagnosis and inform healthcare providers of their pregnancy history when, this, when uh, they seek care after discharge to ensure correct diagnosis and treatment. Um, we think of a lot of the severe morbidity um, being measured in and around the hospital uh, the, 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 the hospitalization for delivery, but a significant portion of it happens after the, after the woman is discharged. So, and, and the signs may not be there during, pre, during, during the hospitalization, they may come up later. So educating all women about the signs and symptoms of preeclampsia is, is important. But for the joint commission requirements at a minimum, signs and symptoms of severe hypertension should be, should be, uh, they should be educated during the hospitalization and um, uh, that would alert the patient to uh, seek immediate care. Educating the, 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 the patient and their family. Um, signs and symptoms after discharge that should alert the patient to seek immediate care are important. And then um, when to schedule the post-discharge follow-up. It's a lot, um, it's all important. And I put this here to just remind us that it's, it's, it's no one individual's job to get this done. It's not your lead nurse, quality nurse job. It's not uh, a nurse manager. It's not the medical director. It takes a team. Um, you, you need your nurses, you need pharmacy, you need anesthesia, you need OB providers, you need everybody involved in this work um, to, to, to be successful. You need your labor and delivery team, you need your antepartum team, you need your ED team, you need your IC team, you need all of those factions to be in sync on this work. I've provided for you um, some, some resources. Um, this is a lot of work, but none of it, you, you don't need to start from scratch. So many resources are available through um, the website for AIM is Safe, safe, safe Healthcare for, uh, I don't know if you want to use that video as a, as a teaching tool that I showed you, that's available on the AIM website. Um, the statewide um, parental quality collaboratives have a lot of information available as well, as does as the, the Maternal Health Innovations um, Learning website. Um, resources through ACOG, through our nursing um, uh, national organization, and through Joint Commission are also listed here for your reference. Um, and the, uh, here, it, here's more in-depth information on things that are available through the Alliance for Innovation um, in Maternal Health. The safety bundles are all there. 
but also there's a lot of safety, patient safety tools that include toolkits, sort of the how-tos um, uh, to get some of this work done. I mentioned that the Voices of Impact recordings are there, um, and then uh, links, of course, to publications for these various bundles and, and implementation strategies. The California Maternal Quality Collaborative is um, really kind of the mother of our maternal quality collaboratives. It's been in place um, the longest and um, is resourced to do tremendous work. Um, and they're, they've got a lot of great information that, that can um, get people started and you can adapt it to your own needs uh, and circumstances. And then I just will put out there that we are your resource as well. Um, here's my email, use it. Um, you'll, if, you, if you haven't met uh, Kristen and Kimberly, um, our district four, our perinatal, our perinatal region four um, nurse champions, um, you'll meet them during the, the, the question and answer period. We're here for you. Thanks for your time. Um, we'll close now and, and welcome your uh, questions and conversation.